This is Dr. Hessel dictating a part one of the podcast on cardiac physiology, which was uh, due on uh, October 4th, uh, 2016. Uh, your reading assignment, we're in uh, one of uh, these uh, the three books. Uh, I have also believe the chapter in uh, the latest edition of Miller is uh, very good. Uh, actually, uh, the same chapter was in the previous edition. Uh, so I'm going to start out uh, covering these various uh, uh, items in the first part, and in the second part we'll cover these items. So it's important that you recognize uh, and understand uh, the Wiggers diagram. And uh, it shows the relationship between the ECG, uh, the pressures uh, uh, in the uh, right and left ventricle and the aorta, uh, the volume in the ventricles, uh, the flow out the aorta, the uh, venous waves, and uh, what you see on echo with the flow through the mitral valve and flow through the pulmonary uh, veins. This is a, another way of displaying the events of the cardiac uh, cycle, um, uh, as is this uh, diagram from uh, Miller's uh, uh, earlier textbook. And uh, this uh, diagram from Gray's Anatomy uh, shows the opening and closing of the uh, valves, uh, AV and VA valves, in the right and left uh, side of the heart. Uh, it is uh, helpful to understand the so-called pressure volume loop. Uh, uh, on the horizontal axis is the volume of the left ventricle, and on the vertical axis is the pressure in the left ventricle. Um, uh, we might uh, start with the onset of systole, um, uh, at which time uh, the mitral valve closes and the ventricle starts to uh, contract. There is a period of so-called isovolumetric contraction uh, while the pressure is rising uh, until it uh, exceeds the aortic diastolic pressure and the aortic valve uh, opens. During this time, there is no change in the volume. Uh, there's then the period of ejection, uh, reaching a peak rate at the peak aortic pressure, and then the pressure gradually falls as the uh, ventricle uh, is emptied and the pressure in the aorta falls uh, until the aortic valve closes. Uh, at this time, the pressure in the ventricle gradually falls as the ventricle relaxes, uh, but uh, uh, does not change its volume until the, mitral, until the pressure falls below the atrial pressure, at which time the mitral valve opens. At this time, then, uh, the flow from the atrium goes into the left ventricle with filling of the left ventricle. Uh, and uh, of course, there's a, uh, a increase in filling towards the end due to atrial contraction. And then we start the cycle over again. Um, we've uh, used this pressure volume loop to reflect uh, the volumes in the ventricle. Uh, the uh, end diastolic volume at the end of filling on average adult is about 150 cc's. The stroke volume is about 100 cc's, uh, leaving uh, about 50 cc's at end systole. The ejection fraction, of course, is the stroke volume divided by the end diastolic volume, which in this case is 100 cc's divided by 150, or 66%. The area inside the pressure volume loop uh, equals stroke work. Uh, this diagram shows there are two important relationships. One is the end systolic pressure volume relationship, which is uh, the 
of pressure at n uh, systole versus the volume at n systole. And the second is the end diastolic pressure volume relationship, which is the uh, end diastolic pressure versus the end diastolic volume. The slope of the end systolic pressure volume relationship it reflects contractility, and the slope of the end diastolic pressure relationship reflects uh, diastolic function. Uh, note that as the slope of the end systolic pressure volume relationship moves, it reflects contractility. As it moves to the right, it reflects decreased contractility, and as the slope increases, it reflects increased contractility. Uh, conversely, as the diastolic slope rises, it reflects decreased compliance and diastolic dysfunction. Let's turn then to the so-called laws of the heart, which are listed on this slide. The most important are preload, afterload, contractility, and lucitropism. Uh, preload in the intact ventricle is the end diastolic volume. In the papillary muscle preparation, it's a stretch before the papillary muscle is stimulated. Starling uh, uh, proposed his law, which says that uh, as you increase the filling, the function increases. And this is reflected on this familiar curve uh, relating uh, cardiac function expressed either in uh, cardiac output or stroke work versus preload expressed either as end diastolic volume or end diastolic pressure. Um, with good contractility, the curve is steep and peaks at a high value. With depressed ventricular function, the curve becomes more shallow. Afterload in the papillary muscle preparation is the amount of weight that the muscle has to lift when it starts to contract. In the intact ventricle, it is the wall tension that the muscle has to develop in order to initiate ejection. In the intact ventricle, afterload is a systolic wall tension. Uh, this is the product of the pressure times the radius of the ventricle divided by the wall thickness. Note that although systolic pressure directly is directly influenced by systemic vas resistance, systemic vas resistance is not synonymous with afterload. Note also that in response to chronic increase in wall tension, the myocardium will hypertrophy, which will increase wall thickness and thus decrease wall tension. Note also that afterload of the ventricle is increased by increased preload because preload influences end diastolic volume, which influences radius, which is in this equation for wall tension. Thus, afterload is influenced by both arterial pressure and filling pressure. This uh, uh, illustrates so-called Laplace's law, which says that wall stress equals pressure times radius divided by two times the wall thickness. Uh, cardiac function declines with increasing afterload. The intact ventricle is relatively insensitive until extreme elevations of afterload, whereas with progressive myocardial dysfunction, the ventricle becomes more and more uh, influenced by elevated afterload. Uh, this is reflected by the impact of uh, decreasing afterload in, in uh, ventricles. For the normal ventricle, uh, decreasing afterload has little benefit on function. But in the sick ventricle, uh, decreasing uh, the afterload results in a considerable increase in function. Thus, afterload reduction is helpful in patients with 
sick ventricles. The third factor is inotropism or contractility. Uh, a pragmatic definition is a change in the function when preload and afterload are the same, or a change in function in a direction opposite to that expected from the effect of a change in preload or afterload. In other words, if function improves despite a decrease in preload or an increase in afterload, it indicates an improvement in inotropism or contractility. So um, what we notice is that when the uh, contractility improves, the uh, Starling curve uh, also improves. Now, an exception to this uh, pragmatic definition is the so-called TREPA effect, which says that cardiac function improves with increasing heart rate, and the phenomenon known as post-extrasystolic potentiation, which indicates that you get an increase in systolic function after a premature beat. Now, estimating contractile state of the intact ventricle is rather complicated. Uh, and there are various types of parameters. The most common used are ejection phrased indices, such as ejection fraction, uh, stroke volume, and stroke work curves, uh, the ejection period. Um, there's also so-called preload uh, recruitable work and isovolumetric phase indices, and finally, the end systolic indices. Um, Ejection fraction is an imperfect estimate of ventricular function because it is sensitive to both preload and afterload. Um, as I've uh, indicated on this uh, slide. Uh, a parameter that uh, is used experimentally is so-called Vmax in, in which they plot uh, the initial velocity of myocardial shortening uh, versus afterload. And uh, as afterload uh, decreases, the velocity increases. And uh, the projected velocity at zero load is called Vmax. And with increasing contractility, the Vmax increases. One of the most popular experimental ways of measuring uh, uh, contractility is the end systolic pressure volume relationship, which we previously commented. That is this point on the uh, volume pressure curve. And uh, what is done is to vary the preload and plot the slope of this curve with various preloads. A as you see, the point increases, but they all lie along this line uh, and the slope of this line is called elastance. That slope reflects contractility um, as uh, depicted here. And so here is a set of curves in which they varied preload and generated uh, a slope. Uh, if you then uh, increase contractility, this slope will become steeper. Uh, conversely, if you depress contractility, the slope will become more shallow. On this slide, I have summarized the impact of baseline cardiac function on the effect of increases preload, afterload, and inotropism. In regard to uh, uh, preload, normally preload increases function of the ventricle. The normal heart is quite sensitive to preload, whereas the depressed heart is less sensitive to preload. Afterload increases normally causes a decrease in output. The normal ventricle is less sensitive to increases afterload, whereas the ventricle with depressed function is more sensitive to afterload. In regards to inotropism, normally it increases function of the heart. Uh, in the normal heart, uh, this is normal, but in the depressed heart, 
the response to inotropic stimuli is reduced. Lucitropism refers to uh, facilitation of diastolic relaxation. It is important to recognize that uh, diastolic uh, relaxation is an energy consuming process uh, and it can be decreased in disease states and uh, pharmacologically. Uh, diastolic function refers to the ability of the ventricle to fill efficiently. Uh, as I said, relaxation is an energy dependent process. Uh, it can be measured invasively <coughs> by uh, the change in pressure in the ventricle with change in volume, but it is also commonly evaluated echocardiographically by analysis of mitral valve and pulmonary vein Doppler flow patterns or analysis of tissue Doppler of the mitral annulus. There are multiple causes of diastolic dysfunction, including hypertrophy, uh, myocardial ischemia, fibrosis, pericardial restraint, and ventricular interaction. On the next few slides, I have summarized some of the echocardiographic uh, reflections of uh, 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 diastolic function. In the upper panel is uh, the uh, tissue Doppler changes of the mitral annulus, and in the lower segment, uh, the changes in mitral valve flow. Um, this uh, diagram also shows other parameters to assess ventricular function, including the isovolumetric relaxation time, uh, the E to A ratio, and uh, the diastolic uh, uh, time. Uh, this uh, slide also shows various uh, Doppler echocardiographic indices used to describe various uh, degrees of diastolic dysfunction. Um, these are some images uh, showing uh, the tissue Doppler of the mitral annulus and uh, mitral valve flow with these various stages of ventricular dysfunction. Um, uh, this shows uh, uh, the uh, diachromatic uh, uh, figure of uh, mitral valve flow with the E wave and the A wave and the various parameters that are used to analyze diastolic dysfunction. Um, and finally, uh, this uh, uh, again shows uh, the relationship between uh, the E to A ratio um, uh, 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 from normal to abnormal. Uh, this slide uh, summarizes the explanation of uh, this uh, previous figure. Let us then turn to cardiac output. There are many factors that affect, quote, normal cardiac output. One is age, and as we age, cardiac output normally tends to fall. Uh, an important parameter is body size but the underlying uh, uh, parameter is oxygen consumption. Uh, normally, cardiac output is uh, determined by venous return, and venous return is determined by the sum of blood flow to each organ, and the blood flow to each organ is determined by the oxygen consumption of each organ. Therefore, the sum of blood flow is proportional to the sum of oxygen consumption. And, of course, oxygen consumption is influenced by temperature, stress, sepsis, trauma, anesthetic state, etc. The mediators of cardiac output are heart rate and stroke volume. Stroke volume, in turn, is the product of end diastolic volume and ejection fraction. Uh, ejection fraction is determined by myocardial factors, including preload, afterload, and contractility, and by pump factors, such as AV synchrony, pattern of depolarization, valve competence, and wall competence. End diastolic volume is determined by the change in the pressure inside versus outside of the ventricle. And of course, in the outside, it's the pericardial or pleural pressure. But end diastolic volume is also influenced by compliant, 
compliance of the ventricle, the flow through the AV valve, and the flow from the peripheral veins into the atrium. The latter is influenced by the pleural and pericardial pressure and the peripheral venous pressure. The latter is influenced by intravascular volume, compliance, position, and abdominal compression, including compression of intra-abdominal veins by surgeons. Ultimately, cardiac output is determined or limited by venous return. Uh, the amount of blood delivered to the venous system and the flow from the venous pulmonary peripheral veins into the atrium. And of course, the flow from the peripheral veins into the atrium is influenced by the pleural and pericardial pressure, the peripheral venous pressure, gravity, the muscle pump, and the thoracoabdominal pump. This shows the normal distribution of cardiac output at rest. Um, uh, note that liver, muscle, and kidney uh, get the predominance of flow, uh, while uh, the heart and skin and intestine uh, get uh, uh, less. Uh, finally, this shows the average distribution of blood flow, uh, excuse me, of blood volume in various organs. About two-thirds of the blood volume is in the systemic veins uh, and um, the rest elsewhere, with about 15% in the systemic arteries, 5% in the systemic capillaries, 9% in the pulmonary circulation, and 7% in the heart and microvasculature. Let us now turn to systemic arterial pressure. Arterial pressure is determined by the product of cardiac output and resistance. And resistance is influenced not only by vessel cal caliber, but also by viscosity. And of course, viscosity is mainly determined by hemoglobin or hematocrit. Uh, this is Poiseuille's equation for resistance. Vascular resistance is uh, uh, given uh, by this general formula of arterial pressure minus venous pressure divided by blood flow. Uh, so systemic vascular resistance is mean arterial pressure minus CVP divided by systemic cardiac output. And pulmonary vascular resistance is mean pulmonary artery pressure minus pulmonary venous pressure or wedge pressure divided by pulmonary blood flow. Both of these are commonly multiplied by the factor 80, which converts the units from wood units, which is what you get if you use millimeters of mercury divided by liters per minute, to the system international unit, which is 9 seconds centimeters to the minus fifth. The factors that influence peripheral vascular tone are summarized on this slide, and they include neural factors, uh, the principal input are the high pressure and low pressure receptors, and the output is via the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. It is also, um, it, uh, note the output of these pressure receptors also influence heart rate, contractility, and hormonal output. This shows the uh, impact of changing arterial pressure um, on heart rate. Uh, by, uh, for instance, giving norepinephrine to increase arterial pressure or giving uh, uh, nitroprusside to decrease arterial pressure. And note that um, as arterial pressure goes down, heart rate goes up, and conversely, as, heart rate, as arterial pressure goes up, uh, heart rate uh, goes down. Perhaps I should have used uh, phenylephrine uh, instead of norepinephrine on this slide, since, uh, as you know, norepinephrine has some direct uh, cardiac uh, chronotropic effect as well. Uh, this shows the effect of arterial pressure uh, on uh, sympathetic output. And notice that uh, as arterial pressure increases, vagal activity increases, well, as arterial pressure increases, uh, sympathetic output uh, decreases. Other factors that influence peripheral vascular tone are hormones. Uh, 
These include systemic hormones such as corticosteroids, corticoids, vasopressin, renin angiotensin, atrial nitratic peptide, and brain nitratic peptide, and also local uh, hormones such as uh, EDRF, endothelin, prostaglandin, and thrombaxin, and finally other local factors like pH, CO2, O2, uh, potassium, lactate, and adenosine. Let me now turn to coronary blood flow, myocardial oxygen demand, and uh, supply. Uh, we'll talk about these uh, uh, four, uh, five, uh, uh, excuse me, six uh, items. Uh, as far as anatomy, uh, this was covered in the previous uh, uh, lecture on on uh, on uh, anatomy. Uh, remember, we have the right coronary and the left coronary, the left uh, branching into the LID and the circumflex, and then I've uh, itemized the various branches of these main arteries. Uh, as far as myocardial metabolism, the under normal aerobo aerobic conditions, most of uh, the energy comes from fatty acids uh, and uh, about a third from glucose and about 20% uh, from lactate. Uh, in health, uh, coronary blood flow is under metabolic control. In other words, uh, uh, coronary blood flow matches uh, oxygen needs. I use the abbreviation uh, CBF, but uh, often that means cerebral blood flow. In this case, I mean uh, coronary blood flow. Uh, uh, metabolic control is to be distinguished from the concept of autoregulation, which reflects the fact that for any given metabolic demand, flow is independent of perfusion pressure. Normal coronary blood flow is about uh, 70 to 80 milliliters per 100 grams per minute, uh, which amounts to about 225 cc's a minute in a normal person, or about 4 to 5 percent of the cardiac output. However, the coronary blood flow can increase uh, tremendously with increased demand, uh, as much as four to five fold. Normally, oxygen extraction is nearly maximal. In other words, uh, the coronary venous saturation, uh, the, coronary, the myocardium extracts about 70% of the oxygen delivered to it, so that the coronary venous saturation is about 30%, or a P uh, coronary sinus PO2 of around 18 to 20. Therefore, if uh, oxygen delivery falls or oxygen demand increases, uh, coronary blood flow must increase if myocardial ischemia is to be prevented. The coronary flow to the left ventricle is predominantly limited to diastole because during systole, the contracting ventricle is squeezing on the arteries, which reduces microvascular flow. Uh, this is not true of the right ventricle, which has a predominant flow during uh, systole. Uh, then let us turn to the balance of myocardial oxygen supply and demand. As I said, normally, uh, this is uh, the supply is regulated to match uh, 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 demand. Uh, oxygen demand is normally uh, uh, what I've already discussed, about eight to ten uh, milliliters per hundred gram uh, per minute, which is one of the highest demands uh, in the body. Um, it is predominantly determined by the mass of the left ventricle because uh, the left ventricle has about five times the mass and five times the wall tension of the right ventricle. The major determinants of oxygen demand are heart rate, wall tension, and contractility. Uh, and the most important are heart rate and wall tension. As I said before, wall tension is determined by radius or end diastolic volume and by systolic pressure. Interesting, uh, interestingly, contractility only influences oxygen demand by plus or minus 10%. Less important to myocardial oxygen demand is the volume work 
uh, basal housekeeping and electrical activity. Oxygen supply is determined by two major factors, the arterial oxygen content and the coronary blood flow. Oxygen content, of course, is influenced by the amount of hemoglobin and the saturation and the PO2, while coronary blood flow is influenced by coronary perfusion pressure. Uh, since blood flow to the left ventricle uh, predominantly occurs during diastole, coronary perfusion pressure is determined by aortic diastolic pressure, uh, mean aortic diastolic pressure minus LV diastolic pressure. This is different from most other organs where perfusion is mean arterial pressure minus, center, minus venous pressure. Since uh, blood flow occurs mainly in diastole, uh, coronary blood flow is influenced by duration of diastole, which is inversely proportional to heart rate. So as heart rate goes up, the diastolic time goes down, and hence oxygen supply is limited. And finally, it's influenced by resistance. Normally, this is regulated uh, uh, to match resistance so that supply matches metabolic needs. Uh, but it can also be influenced uh, abnormally if you have uh, obstruction of conducting vessels. Other factors that influence uh, flow of oxygen to the myocardium is the capillary density and the distance of the capillary to the mitochondria, which of course is influenced by adversely affected by hypertrophy. This demonstrates one way of uh, balance of uh, estimating the balance of myocardial oxygen supply and demand. Since uh, oxygen demand is determined by the area under the systolic pressure curve, while oxygen supply occurs mainly during diastole, the ratio of these two areas uh, have been used to uh, explain the balance or describe the balance of oxygen supply and demand. And when the when uh, supply uh, side goes down or demand side goes up, uh, you can develop an imbalance. Um, importantly, the subendocardium is at greatest risk of an imbalance of supply and demand. This is because the subendocardium has the highest oxygen demand because it has the highest myocardial wall tension, and yet it has the least coronary flow and reserve uh, because it has the lowest uh, dias aortic diastolic minus LV diastolic pressure gradient because it's exposed directly to the LV end diastolic pressure. It's also at the end of the line from the end epicardium to the endocardium. Uh, thus, uh, the subendocardium is at greatest risk of experience ischemia, and this is a location of much perioperative myocardial ischemia, which we will be discussing in a subsequent lecture. Let us uh, then turn to systemic oxygen supply uh, and uh, demand. Um, uh, systemic oxygen delivery is normally uh, again, uh, matched with demand. Uh, when demand goes up, supply goes up by increasing cardiac output, and conversely, when demand goes down, uh, supply normally uh, uh, goes uh, down by decreasing cardiac output. Now, normally, we have a luxuriant oxygen delivery. Oxygen delivery is calculated as the product of cardiac index times arterial oxygen content. And with a normal hemoglobin, a normal arterial oxygen saturation, and a normal cardiac index, the normal oxygen delivery index is about 700 milliliters per minute per meter squared. On the other hand, normal oxygen consumption is uh, only about 140 uh, milliliters per minute per meter squared, which suggests we have a luxuriant supply. On this slide, I have diagrammed the uh, relationship between body oxygen consumption and uh, oxygen delivery. As I said before, normally oxygen delivery is around 700 uh, milliliters per minute per meter squared. 
Uh, as oxygen delivery goes down, uh, oxygen consumption remains stable until it gets critical, which is at about 300 milliliters per minute per meter squared. At this point, uh, the uh, saturation uh, in the venous blood is down around 50%. And uh, therefore, uh, the PO2 uh, is uh, only around uh, 27. And uh, if it goes any lower, the tissue PO2 goes below the level necessary to maintain uh, metabolic activity. And so oxygen consumption falls, becomes critical, developing lactic acidosis. Let me then turn to the electrical activity of the heart. Uh, you're well familiar with this uh, depolarization uh, of uh, the uh, uh, myocardial cells. Uh, and uh, I've just uh, summarized the various phases uh, of uh, the shift of the um, uh, uh, negative, normal negative state inside the cell during uh, depolarization, uh, going from a negative uh, uh, 80 to 100 uh, down to positive, and then it gradually plateaus and then is restored back to negative. Uh, this is numbered by various phases, uh, as illustrated on this uh, 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 data on the right, uh, and uh, what uh, electron movements are associated with these phases. Um, these same phenomena are then illustrated in this diagram from Burns' uh, physiology textbook. Um, uh, uh, phase one, the fast sodium channel opening. Uh, phase two, the potassium channel. Uh, uh, phase one, I should say. Uh, phase two, uh, the calcium channel. Uh, uh, phase uh, three, uh, the uh, potassium channel and phase four, the potassium channel. Now, uh, all uh, myocardial tissues have a, a characteristic rate of spontaneous depolarization. Uh, it's fastest in the SA node, uh, next fastest in the AV node, and slowest uh, in the his purkinje system. Uh, this shows the propagation of the action potential uh, through the heart. This is the action potential uh, uh, of, of the SA node, uh, the action potential of the AV node, and then the action potential through various uh, components of the his purkinje system. All of these combine then to generate the surface ECG as illustrated in the bottom here. So the progress of depolarization uh, between the SA node and the AV node takes about four hundredths of a second. From the AV node uh, to the his purkinje about eleven hundredths of a second. And so the uh, PR interval is about fifteen hundredths of a second. Uh, it then only takes about six hundredths of a second for uh, 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 depolarization of the rest of the heart. This uh, completes uh, part one of uh, the podcast on uh, basic uh, physiology of the heart.